guys, and welcome to the 11th episode of Brent Ewing's Hey Buddy Podcast. It's been a while since I put out a podcast. Last one was with Charlie Mannering, and I, I thank you guys for listening to that. Hope you enjoyed that one. Today's episode is going to be with uh, my friend Megan Jenkins Montgomery. But first, just want to just want to send out my best wishes to you guys. I hope you guys are all staying safe. Uh, this is a crazy thing that's going on right now with this virus. Um, you, you know, it's I know it's got everybody's and everybody's lives in a tailspin right now. Everybody's kind of wondering what's next, and and this social distancing has everybody kind of on edge and and uh the the panic with with groceries and toilet paper and all that kind of stuff but uh hang in there guys um keep practicing the social distancing uh get out there take walks you know get outside get the fresh air uh take rides whatever you need to do but stay away from people as best you can you know don't go to the stores don't gather in groups don't don't be that guy who thinks it can't happen to me uh, just get on YouTube, get on, you know, Fox News, CNN, whatever you need to get on, and watch these videos of um, of these nurses, you know, that that are that are there on the front lines. Uh, thank goodness, you know, I work in a hospital uh, here on Maui, but thank goodness that that we've been lucky so far. We have about 26 cases total on the island, um, but there's only there's either zero or one uh, reported case at the hospital, so we've been pretty lucky here. Um, but you know, everybody's, everybody here's, you know, nervous as well. We're all panicked. We're all, what do we do? Uh, you know, the mask situation, the, the PPE situation, you know, what do, what do we wear? Gowns, gloves, masks, you know, things like that. It's, it's got everybody here kind of in a, uh, in, in panic mode. But, uh, you know, th- those folks in New York right now, um, they seem to be getting hit the hardest. And if you, if you get time, you know, get online and, and watch, What's some of the videos coming out of Michigan, coming out of New York, coming out of California, these places that are being really impacted um, really hard right now. It's really it's really tough to see. You know, these folks are going in and working 12, 16-hour days, um, just being totally exhausted and putting their lives on the line for, for these folks. You know, that's what they signed up for. It's their job, but still you have to feel for them. And, and getting to the points where we're not having enough ventilators and – and you know it's just it's a sad situation so guys we really need to we really need to follow these these guidelines and try to you know try to quarantine yourself the best you can again it doesn't mean you can't get out you can't take walks things like that get out get fresh air but uh you know use this time to catch up on your reading catch up on your on your netflix binge some shows um you know just be with family right now um use that time to you know, use that time to, to bond. Um, and hopefully within a, a month or so, you know, this will really start to take a downturn and, you know, we'll be able to get some semblance of, of real life back. I know it sucks, um, but again, keep doing what we're doing and hopefully this uh, we'll beat this thing together and uh, get back to, to a normal life. But uh, back to the podcast, guys. Again, thanks for listening to the episode with Charlie Mannering. Um, I think this episode with Megan is really interesting um, my first female on the show, so that was fun to, to talk to Megan again. I've known her since, you know, we graduated school together. We've had a lot of good memories together. Um, we were friends. We were never, you know, necessarily, we didn't hang out a lot in the same circles, but, uh, I knew a lot of, of Megan's story, but when I heard it, uh, you know, again, and, and her tell me in depth and in detail, which she will in this, you know, this podcast, um, I really got a sense of, how much she's been through. Um, so it's a, you know, there's some, some points in this podcast that, uh, where she kind of bears it all and, and you kind of get a real glimpse into, into Megan's story, which is a sad story and, and also a, a really happy story at the end and how she's, how she's made some changes in her life. But, uh, guys, I hope you, I hope you stay safe out there and, uh, hope you guys enjoy my interview with Megan Jenkins Montgomery. Hello. Megan. Yes. What is happening? <laughs> Not much. Good. Good to hear. Good to hear your voice, man. I haven't heard from you for a while. I know. It's been a long time. No doubt. How's life? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, you might hear my dog bark occasionally. I apologize. No problem. No problem. We have some construction going on around here, too, so you may hear some clanging and banging around, but uh, usually it doesn't pick up on the feed so we should be okay okay 
So uh, what's the what's the what's the nervousness about? What's uh, just two old chums talking, right? Just gonna just gonna talk about yeah. the last. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it's um, I don't know. I'm not as shy about putting my life on display, but this feels like it's a bigger display. <laughs> sure, all those dozens of listeners that I have. <laughs> <laughs> No, hey, you know, I've been pretty, I've been pretty excited. I get a few hundred people to listen to each episode, and I'm like, that's kind of cool, you know. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's uh, give me a little bit about what's up with with Megan these days? What are you into? Where are you living? Where are you working? Well, um, I live in Grove City now, right outside of Columbus. Um. That was sort of a compromise with me and the husband. <laughs> He's a little country, and I'm a little city. All right. Um, I work at Nationwide Children's Hospital. I've been there four years, and I work in marketing, public relations. So um, a lot of the things that you see sort of public-facing, um, I have, I'm involved in those things. Um now, it's broken up into a lot of different departments. Um, I'm not in the video or commercials or anything like that. More like um, brochures and flyers and signage and things like that. Very cool. Very cool. I think the yeah. last time I think the last time we spoke, you were probably still working as like a, a clerk or I forget exactly what – what was it you a did? Paralegal. Paralegal. Yes, yes. That was, yeah. I think that's the last time that I've actually, you know, face to face talked to you. Obviously, we message yeah, occasionally, so. but yeah. Um, I did that for a really long time, like maybe 13, 15 years, something like that. Oh wow. Um, yeah, I got my degree at Shawnee State University, and then I went right into that. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, you know, what propelled the change was um. My mom passed away in 2012 unexpectedly, and as you know, I had a rocky relationship with her. She wasn't really that involved in my life, but it was still a trauma, Um, and I had a hard time with it. Obviously, carried a lot of guilt because not only was she not involved in my life, I also kept her out of my life once I was an adult, and um, it really, really affected me, and it basically consumed me. I had a hard time thinking about anything else but that. So I decided I needed something to do, something extra, not just going to work and coming home and the daily things. So I um, I went back to school, and I enrolled at Ohio University in Chillicothe because that's where I lived at the time. And I got my bachelor's degree in communications which was totally off the wall. Like I never imagined <laughs> that I would ever be in that field, mm-hmm. but I just wanted a distraction at the time, just something to put pen to paper on and focus on. And it worked. And right after I got my degree, um, I went to Nationwide Children's and I left law and I gave it a shot. And here you are. How cool is and that? And here I am. I know. That's it's, it's crazy how sometimes <laughs> life kind of points us in directions that we never thought we would go into, right? I know. I would have never imagined this. I I was pretty in love with law for a long time, but I was getting burnt out, and the new direction was a leap of faith, and so far it's worked out. Awesome. I was talking to uh, a friend of ours, I guess, Stephanie Preston actually messaged me um I don't know, two weeks ago or so when she found out about the podcasts and she was talking, I'm like, hey, I love the podcast, but hey, any chance, you know, you're going to have some female guests on there? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'm still new at this. So obviously when you're when you're kind of new at it and, and you're you're trying to think of things to talk about, you kind of go with what you know, you know, you go with what's comfortable. Right. And I'm like, absolutely. yeah, eventually I want to do that, but I don't, <laughs> I'm trying to think, you know, your name had crossed my mind, Katie's name had crossed my mind. But I didn't want to just be like, okay, let me let me just out of nowhere talk to somebody. But she she even mentioned your name. And I was like, you know what? Oh. That's a really that's a really good um, a really good suggestion because that, you know following you on Facebook and and obviously we've known each other for geez probably thirty years now or whatever. But mm-hmm. it's it's really interesting going back over the last couple of days and reading a lot of your 
your blogs and uh, just your posts on Facebook. You've had a pretty interesting, if that's a word I can use, I guess, a pretty interesting life. Like some some good, some not so good, some stuff that you've, you've had to deal with and stuff you've tried to deal with publicly, which I felt pretty – that's pretty cool. When you can take that step and kind of put that out there like, hey, I'm struggling, but I know I'm not the only one struggling. So here's my yeah. story. You know, <laughs> maybe this will help – will help somebody else to hear it. So I thought that was pretty cool. So like I said, I've spent, I don't know, the last couple of days going back and reading and your writing is excellent. It's it's cool to put that out there. And like we spoke about or texted about earlier, even if nobody really reads it, sometimes just getting that stuff out there, same here with me doing this. If nobody listens, that's fine, but I'm still doing it and having fun with it and putting it out there. Yeah, absolutely. And interesting is a good word. I don't, I'm not offended by interesting or anything, but I am so proud of Steph for hedging the whole feminist movement. <laughs> right, and she wasn't. She was like, "Hey, I'm gonna." Li-. She's like, "Hey, I'm gonna listen anyway." I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just saying, and, and obviously, I did have. You know, again, I, I was gonna have females on, but I, it was. You go with what you're comfortable with at first, and and okay, I'm comfortable with sports and music and and movies and things like that. Well, that's kind of you know a lot of times that's you and your buddies, that's you and your dudes, kind of getting around talking and things like that. When I you know started doing more and more, I'm like okay, I started writing down you know names that I'd like to get on, and and there's you know I got five or six females in the in the lineup right now that I'm I'm gonna try to get a get a hold of and see if they would like to talk a little bit. But you were definitely the first one that popped up when I when I thought about that after after going back and reading and and uh talking to you and you say yeah i would you know i'd like to do it and like to talk about it so i thought that was pretty cool and i appreciate you coming on that's so awesome it's definitely an honor to even be thought about that's and for two people i mean you and steph (laughs) who else do you need right (laughs) (laughs) my head is just expanding right now it's so funny because you know you grow up with everybody i've had on here so far it's all been, with the exception of Bird Mannering, you know, I didn't know Bird personally before I interviewed him, and then I have an interview coming out with Coach Blackstone here pretty soon that uh, will have already aired once this airs, but I, mm-hmm. all the other people that I talked to, it was just, you know, me and friends that I grew up with, so you have that comfort level, and you start to kind of, you know, you get in that routine of, man, you just fall back into old times, but even yeah, even absolutely. talking to even talking to friends that you grew up with, or you spent all this time around, there's still a life that they lead that you don't know anything about. You know, talking to AJ, I, I knew a lot of, of what was going on there with AJ, but when they came on and talked, I found out so much more that I didn't know. And mm-hmm. so that's, you know, getting back and talking to you and reading some of your posts and your blogs and things was, it's like, wow, this is, you know, we grew up together, but I didn't know a lot of this stuff. Oh, yeah. It's it's a huge disconnection now that we're all adults. And, you know, they, I think everybody wish, issued warnings when we were younger, you know, treasure this. When you grow up, you'll lose contact. You won't keep in touch. And it's true. It does happen. Absolutely. And Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff's made us lazy anyway. It's like, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, I don't really need to call, you know, this person or that person. I know what they had for lunch. I haven't spoken to them in 10 years. <laughs> But I know what they had for lunch, you know. So it's kind of right. it's kind of made us lazy and get away from that type of thing, which is kind of sad. Um, but everybody has their own lives and they kind of pull away. But in you know, in the other sense, it's like you kind of make time for the people you want to make time for. You know, it's you, you always have good intentions, I think. But when it comes down to it, it's hard to get anybody to do anything. I mean, even if you have a, a free day, well, I've worked all week and I, I want to do this, I want to do that. Well, that's cool, but you can clean, you know, next week. Like, let's hang out today, or let's talk today, or let's go get lunch today. But you don't mm-hmm. see, you don't see things like that happening. It seems like you get those friendships get kind of pushed further and further and further apart until one day you haven't seen or talked to each other in ten or fifteen years, and like, what the heck happened? Yeah, and I think social media is a huge factor of that. But I know before social media, it was happening to people anyway. But Social media has definitely taken its toll. No doubt. Well, let's hop into a few things because, again, I think getting your story out there is kind of, you know, it could help some people. Um, we talked about, you touched on it briefly about your relationship, you know, growing up with 
with your mother, and then I know you know your grandmother kind of took you in at a at a young age. Just just kind of walk a, walk me through that. Talk talk a little bit about that, and talk a little bit about your grandmother, who most people listening to this you know knows um, and, and and has <laughs> has fond memories of. So just kind of touch on that a little bit. Okay. Well, um, since let's see, the my entire youth, my my mom had rocky relationships with men. Um, and up until the beginning of seventh grade. So I was probably around 11. I don't think I had turned 12 yet. So I was 11. My little brother drew was nine and, um, we had once again moved. We moved a lot of course, because in that cycle of, of that pattern, you, you move a lot, your mom dates a lot, your mom gets married a lot. There's a lot of things going on. (laughs) So, um, we had moved back to Wellston from Benton County. We were in there. We were in Benton County for two years. I had went to Allensville school in fifth and sixth grade, but other than that, Wellston my entire life. Um, so we moved back to Wellston, got enrolled back into Wellston junior high, seventh grade. And I think I only attended a few days. I think it was up until September 18th, Um, so maybe two weeks, because back then school started at the end of August, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe about two or three weeks, and my brother and I came home one day, and there was an eviction notice on the apartment, on the door, and we walked into the house. My mother always left it unlocked for us, so we walked into the house or the apartment, and she wasn't there, which wasn't abnormal. She had a job, and she liked to run with her friends. So it, it, no red flags were present at that moment. Um, so we waited the entire evening, and she never came home. Um, her, we went into her bedroom. All of her stuff was gone. Her bed, her clothes, her personal items. Everything was gone, but in our bedroom, everything was there. So we knew something was off. So we just kept waiting, thinking, okay, we're moving. She's going to come back and get our stuff or get us. Um, Night came, and we still hadn't seen her. So my brother and I walked to a friend's house where we would normally be with her. She was friends with this lady, and she wasn't there. So we walked back home. And we just kind of sat out on the stoop of the apartment waiting for her to come. We didn't know what else to do at that time. This is before cell phones and all of those things. Um, It just so happened to be a block away from the junior high where I went to school. And it was right by the JVAC. Um, I think, I can't remember his first name, but Mr. Wall owned it. Chris's dad? Yeah, Dan. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. It had, like, a garage underneath and apartments up top. Mm -hmm. So um, we were just sitting there, and it was getting late, like 9 p.m., and my grandma, my grandma Jenkins, who everyone knows as Mrs. Jenkins, the seventh grade teacher, um, she was leaving the junior high because she's often stayed late to grade papers and such, and she drove by the apartment and happened to see us outside waiting and she stopped and asked what was going on we told her we hadn't seen mom all day we didn't know what was wrong Um, we couldn't find her so she told us to get in Um, she also happened to live right above the junior high so we were maybe two blocks apart this entire time so we were easy to find had my mom come home and wondered where we were Um, but she didn't and it was days and days, and we never heard from her or saw her. No one was looking for us. And it, I mean, it was a pivotal moment in my life, of course. She, um, we didn't have the best circumstances, obviously. We grew up poor and moving all the time and man to man. And, but it was just a whole new level of devastation to not have your mom come home or look for you. Sure. So, um, 
it eventually just snowballed into this thing. Like my dad actually came and got us, um, and took us home with him. And so we stayed with him for about six months and he filed for custody of us. And my mom did show up at court. Now, when I was younger, my dad, I have great memories. He was the best dad. He, I mean, just loved us so much and took great care of us. But those six months with him were a living hell. He had clearly started using drugs. Um, He was physically and mentally abusive to us, cruel. I mean, to the point where it was very cruel, um, relentless. Sometimes we had to stay home from school because our marks were too bad. um, And he would get reported, so he wouldn't send us. So it was the most hellacious six months I had endured. Um, And then our court date came where the judge was going to decide custody and whether or not to award it to my dad. And my mom showed up, um, which I was shocked to see. I hadn't seen her in a little over six months at that point. Wow. And she, she wouldn't even look at us because we were sitting out in the hall waiting to be called into the chambers for our turn. She wouldn't even look at us. It was just devastating. So um, the judge called us in. We got to talk to him privately and then out in front of everybody in in the courtroom. Um, And he actually ended up awarding my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, Libby Jenkins, custody of us. Um, It's all a blur now, but I remember it being something along the lines of my mom didn't want my dad to have us, but she also didn't want us. So her and my dad never got along so it's understandable why she was holding that grudge in particular (laughs) so (laughs) my grandma volunteered to take us so she was awarded custody that day and we went and lived with my grandma after that and she raised us till we graduated wow that's bless your grandmother's heart man i can still close my (laughs) eyes seriously i can close my eyes and hear her her voice from class you know what i mean like (laughs) you have those certain memories that kind of stick with you and you can just hear her or see her up there grading those papers. She was she was always fun. Uh, oh yeah. For her to step in like that, man, I can't I can't imagine a what went through her mind when she drove by and saw you, and then you said, "Hey, mom, you know, I, I don't know exactly what you said, but like, hey, mom's not here. Mom never came home. Like, what the heck would have went through her mind at that time? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then for her not to show back up, do you did she have any contact with your mom? I know you said you didn't see her for like six months, but. Had they been in contact? Had your mom at least called to check in? Is that something you ever found out? I did not find out, so I'm just assuming she didn't. But, again, it could just be something my grandma withheld from me, especially if it was sad information. Sure. (laughs) Um, She, and I'm sure that there's a lot I probably don't know just because of my age and she withheld but, um, yeah, I never found out if they had any communication whatsoever. Wow. That, to me, somebody who grew up obviously with, I mean, my parents and I do everything together. We always did everything together. Everything was us three, you know, and we're mm-hmm. su- super close and super tight. So for something like that, for me to hear something like that, it's just so foreign that I don't even understand it. I don't even, I'm like, how, I don't even get how that could be a possibility that somebody would ever even think of doing that I, I never grew up with my parents never raised their voice with each other they never raised their voice with me they still haven't it's like I, your parents are so amazing I love them well I, I appreciate that <laughs> they, they think highly of you they always tell me if they if they've run into you they always they always let me know but I remember I think I got in trouble I got smacked maybe on the butt and not hard mind you um, this was back when you could still do that in the 80s. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe twice. I think my mom said once I ran out into the road and she kind of, you know, smacked me on the butt. Oh, yeah. And then one time I think she said I, I said something to her that I shouldn't have. Um, and I think I got a little whooping that time. But my punishments were always go sit on your bed. Go sit on your bed. And so I would go, you know, I'd be in there. I'd smart off or say something. I had a little bit of a temper. And uh, 
I would say something and I'd go sit on my bed, but I knew, always knew within a few minutes dad would come in because I kind of, I, I, dad was a little bit, uh, dad was a softy a little bit and not that mom wasn't, but I would be in on the bed and I was like, just wait 10 minutes. Dad'll be in and he'll let you up. Just wait 10 minutes. And he would always come in. Okay, buddy, come on back in. <laughs> it's, it's like, Oh, I, just that re- just that relationship I mean I never got grounded they always trusted me they always you know we always had that relationship where if I'm going somewhere I'm gonna tell them hey I'm gonna go out I'm gonna do you know I'm going out to Wade's okay I might not be back till four or five in the morning but they never questioned that they knew they trusted me they knew where I was gonna be and and uh it's just, just you know that relationship we had if I ever wanted to go somewhere we had a little a little change drawer hey you know take take a buck or two and and go to the movies or take a buck or two and go bowling. You don't have to ask. Just take it and go. And like, so I can't, I can't even imagine the, I just can't imagine, I can't imagine where you, where you came from on that. And, and the way, you, especially the way you've turned out is, it's pretty impressive because typically people coming from homes like that, um, you know, sometimes they, they steer down a different path. Absolutely. That's why I'm very vocal and proactive about, um, defending my brother because that is typically and statistically the path I should have been on. Um, yeah, so fill, I mean, fill everybody in on that. We talked about it a little bit. I, I wanted to make sure that you were okay talking about this because I had, again, read your blog about your brother. Um, go ahead and, and fill everybody in on, on what you're talking about there. Okay, well, um, my brother turned out <laughs> the way – Statistics say he should have, coming from a broken and abusive background. Um, He started self-medicating at a young age, I think when he was a teenager. Um, He was great in sports. He, I mean, just blew everyone's mind with football and baseball. And he was such a good kid. And I think um, I'm a little more emotional, and he isn't. So holding all that in... It was very painful for him, and he just got to the point where he started abusing drugs, um, pills in the beginning, and then it escalated. Of course, everyone knows the story of you can't afford the pills, so you start looking for alternatives like heroin and meth and things like that. Um, and he struggled with that for years. Um, I always expected a phone call in the middle of the night that said he was dead. He finally got clean. Um, He had been to a few programs over the years. He had been arrested over the years for minor things, in and out, um, never any prison time or anything. But he was clean for years. Um, I'm thinking it was five or six years recently, the most recent. And he held a job. He has a daughter. He gets her every weekend and some days through the week. And he was doing so well. I really was blindsided when I got the call that he had been picked up for meth. Um, I had let my guard down. I trusted that he was clean for good. And that was my mistake. I mean, an addict is an, is an addict, whether they're sober or not. They, they'll always carry that piece where they could go backward any moment. Um, he was in jail and I think he was in jail almost a year. Uh, he kept going to several court dates and things being pushed back and he had actually gotten out once on his own recognizance, but he missed a court date, didn't show up. So they put a warrant out and they arrested him. So he was in jail almost a year. He, um, the last time I went to court was in the fall I think October September or October and that was the decision day we were going to hear what the judge would recommend he was facing 18 years or 18 months in prison um and we were terrified we were really terrified because I mean you never hear good stories about prison. <laughs> we were scared he would get hurt. I mean, just a million things run through your head. Um, so that day, the judge said, 
I could send you to prison, but I don't think that will heal your problem. I think you'll be right back in here once you get out. We really need to address your addiction issue. Um, so he said, I'm going to sentence you to rehab. I think it was 90 days, if I remember correctly. 90 days of rehab, five years of probation, and no license for two years or five years. It was pretty harsh on the no license thing. Um, but, I mean, it was the best sentencing we could hope for. It. We prayed that he got to a rehab and got help. Um and that's what he did. He went to rehab. He just actually got home a couple weeks ago, a couple days before Christmas, actually. And he seems to be doing great. Um, but, I mean, it's an uphill climb. I don't know that he'll be great forever. I They have to battle it every day and just try to get through it. But I'm really, really hopeful that he takes advantage of the tools he learned when he was in rehab. No doubt. Good for him, and hopefully hopefully that sticks. I have you know, a similar story to, to your situation My with my dad and my uncle. You know, they grew up in the same household, kind of seeing the same things every day. My, you know, my grandfather liked to drink, and, and he would, you know, I guess wasn't easy on the kids. And, uh, you know, my, my dad and my uncle grew up in the same room and seeing the same things, and they took the complete opposite turns. And, you know, my uncle ended up, you know, into drugs and drinking heavy and had numerous kids that uh, we're not even sure the exact number, but close to 10 we know of, and, <laughs> and you know, it, it caught up to him at the end, and he ended up, you know, passing away. I think he was 58 years old when he when he died, and uh, there's some, oh, that you know. Is so young. Right, and, and now his, his daughter, you know, my cousin Cheyenne, I don't know if you know her or not, and I'm not trying to throw her name under the bus or throw her under the bus. I mean, it's clearly out there. If you Google anything about her, you know, she's had a lot of a lot of issues the past 15 years or so since she graduated with with you know men in and out of her life and 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 drug abuse and pills and all this stuff that she just can't kick and uh she had a a thing this past this past spring where it made national news uh that she actually was wandering around the neighborhood one night walked into a house sat down and started petting the the oh, dog I did read that. yeah right I so did she, read that. Yeah. yeah so she was petting the dog and then she just got up and started doing these people's dishes like and she didn't know them like here comes a girl wandering into your house you know at night like what the heck's going on and they showed her picture and it was just it, it was a it, I mean we knew she did this stuff but when you see that and then you see all the responses on uh, you know on Facebook or Shannon Sharp, NFL Hall of Famer, even retweeted her picture with a captioning of something along the lines of, it looks like she's on that hillbilly crack. And I'm like, dude, like, first of all, this this girl has two young kids. Um, They don't need to hear that about their mom. Like, they know she's never around. She's in and out of their lives. She, you know, and same thing, she'll do whatever it takes to get, you know, to get high. Uh, we've, we've tried to talk to her. We've tried to get her. She's been in and out of jail recently and it's like go to rehab you have to go to rehab but she just won't take that next step and do it and it's like you know you're 30 I think she's 32 or 33 years old now and she doesn't work two kids jumps from guy to guy it's like if this isn't your rock bottom what do you need to to do to you know to get help look at your two kids man go and don't you want to raise them don't you want to be around them you know luckily they have her mom and they have my parents who are always there for them, taking them to get food, taking them to get milk, t- getting them to school. It's like, I, yeah, the, the way it kind of affected her. And even though, even when she was a kid, you know, my grandmother, my my dad, my mom, like she was always with us. She was like my sister. And even that, she was always, uh, I won't say depressed, but she was always, she was never happy. She wasn't a happy kid. All the old pictures you see, she's never smiling. So you can see that it was from an early age that she was really affected by what was going on in her life. So to see her turn out like she did, you kind of saw that path coming from an early age, you know? Yeah. I have a theory that addicts, you know, when they have things in their life, they should choose over drugs such as kids and family and jobs. 
about it. When they're in the depths of it, they have lost all instinct to react as an average human, to have feelings about jobs and kids and things like that because they're in survival mode and the only way to survive is to get their next drug mm-hmm. yeah that makes it's perfect just sense. so sad it's it's so sad it's devastating and the amount of grandparents and family members that are raising kids now because their their child is an addict is astronomical back when we were young being raised by my grandmother was very rare and it it wasn't something that really happened a lot unless maybe your parent had passed away or something like that Mm -hmm. but I always remember feeling like an outsider because I had a grandma I didn't have a mom and dad it was it was very unheard of back then and now it's just it's everywhere isn't it crazy to say back then and realize that that's been 25, 30 years ago? I know. Y- you know? It's like, what? It makes me feel so old. <laughs> it seems like we were just on the uh, the Washington trip not long ago, right? Oh, my gosh. Yes. That's, With our fake Oakleys. <laughs> that's still one of my favorite – that's still one of my favorite memories ever from school. That was just – even though it rained on us, uh, that was one of the f- my favorite trips we ever did as as a you know as a group as a class with the chaperones Isla going you know Jake's mom going and my parents going uh-huh. and it, that was just such a fun such a fun time. I think that's when I really bonded with your parents. They were so kind to me and did anything they could to help me check on me, and then it just carried on after that. Anytime they saw me out or during a school function, they made sure to check how I was doing, excuse me, check how I was doing, and um, just, like, just really be a comfort. They were so, so kind. Well, I I appreciate that. I know they always had, they always talked about you and Troy, the back and forth. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the drama. (laughs) The back and forth banner of you and Troy me just, I mean, even today we still talk. If we, if we're going through pictures and we see those, man, we just crack up or talk about bub dancing in the bus up and down the aisles. Gosh. Oh my gosh. Those were the, the funnest times. I mean, that trip from beginning to end was just amazing. I don't think I had a bad moment or a bad memory from any of it. I agree, yeah, I it was a blast. It, we had some good ones, but that was probably the best in my opinion. Yeah, we took our Discmans and oh. listened to Alanis Morissette and Adam Sandler. A- absolutely, absolutely. That <laughs> I wasn't allowed to have the Adam Sandler CD, so I had to borrow it. Oh, and yeah. It back. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't imagine have, have buying that. I didn't have it. I think Troy. I think Troy Mead had it, or him or John Harris, one of the two. And I remember we had it in the <laughs> hotel room, and of course we were cracking up. Looking back, you're like, man, this is so stupid. But yeah, you know, when you're 12 years old, that's hilarious. Right. I mean, immaturity is <laughs> is great. <laughs> well, I'm still. I, there's still plenty of me. I would say I'm at least 51 percent still immature. Um, <laughs> definitely, definitely still have that. I'll, I'll talk to Bub or me, me and Bub text about every day. And uh, it just stupid stuff, whether it's just a meme that we send back and forth or mm-hmm. just some stupid saying. I mean, we're both – obviously, we're, you know, we're all the same age, and we grew up uh, – Say, by, me and Bub were huge Saved by the Bell fans, right? So we'll just – out of the oh, blue, yeah. we'll text some stupid quote from Saved by the Bell, just any, anything. You know, just to have that – we have that relationship where I don't see him as much as I would like. Even when I'm home, it's hard to get together, but – you just you pick up right where you left off when you do, and it's it, it life like we said earlier, life kind of gets away from you. But uh, to have those memories and, and cherish all those things we did together, I guess that's what's yeah. that's one good thing about Facebook and things like that is is sometimes those memories will pop up and you'll see pictures from oh man, look at this picture from you know that we posted ten years ago that we took when we were seniors in high school or whatever. It's kind of fun, kind of fun looking back on that. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but Katie and I actually worked together. I didn't. I knew you guys were still close, and I knew you guys hung out quite a bit, but I didn't know that you worked together. That's cool. Yeah. It's it's so funny that when I got my communications degree, I had a little trouble getting on at Children's. Um, it was difficult, to say the least. Um, it really... 
it really seemed like I needed to know somebody or put some feelers in somewhere. Um, so I actually took a different job when I was hired in and thought if I get my foot in the door, then I can get into communications or marketing. And it did work. It worked out. But um, it's, it's so funny because she had just started there in marketing and we just both kind of ended up at the same place unintentionally. Um, and now we are one cube apart from each other and we work on the same marketing team. <laughs> How funny is that? I know. It just all worked out. It's hysterical. That's, that's super cool. That's, uh, I'm sure that's, and, and again, you guys hung out a lot before that, but I'm sure this has kind of made you guys even closer, huh? Oh, absolutely. We, um, we did hang out and we texted, not every day, of course, because we're guilty of having busy lives as well, but um, it's definitely brought us closer. Um, we talk every day now, we text every day now, not just work things, but you know, fun things as well. And we're actually taking a trip tomorrow. Um, us and a few other girls are going up to the wine country. We're staying in an Airbnb and just kind of relaxing all weekend and visiting some wineries. Okay. That sounds like she's going to leave Brandon alone by uh, alone. That's, uh, <laughs> sure. I know. All right. Risky little game. <laughs> Literally Katie bar the door, huh? <laughs> that's funny that's 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 two people it's so funny you you see you know again you grow up with people and and you see their personalities and you're like katie and brandon really <laughs> but they're so perfect like they're so perfect yeah. together you know yeah they have been together forever it feels like now it's hard to remember a time they weren't at this point right so this this trip is there any chance there'll be the uh, five page in sync letter like you guys take that do you discuss that oh, do you discuss gosh. that at all or uh... <laughs> I hope not I regret the day I gave that to her I don't know anything about it I just read in your in your little oh. in your blog and I was like I got to bring that up just to razz her a little oh. bit. I wrote it when I was like fourteen or something you know when the big boy band craze was out and I was die hard in sync. You have to choose a team. You can't have NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. <laughs> right. So I wrote this letter to them that I had intended on sending them, and I didn't because I'm sure I was a squirrely 14-year-old and something else distracted <laughs> me. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then I found it a few years ago in an old notebook that was packed away, and I gave it to her. I said, you've got to read this. You're going to die laughing. So she read it, and I was like, that cannot be public. You cannot <laughs> post it. It can't go anywhere. I said, but if you want to include it in my eulogy someday, you can. <laughs> now, that way I'm dead. <laughs> now, see, that's something you should add to the blog. You should just make it look. Here it is. This is my blog oh. for this month. It's my NSYNC oh, letter. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it was just obsessive about how much I loved them. That's so funny. Uh, we're we're here at the. I'm here on Maui, and and they always have pretty good concerts down here at the Mac. And I actually went and watched a concert this past weekend uh, with a group called Old Dominion. They're a country band. Well, whatever today's country is, it's you know pop country. Um, right. But they were showing previews for upcoming, you know, shows and and whatnot. And they're actually having uh, the Nick Lachey, um, uh, ninety eight <laughs> degrees. They're actually going to be here in, uh, I think, on Valentine's Day or like around Valentine's Day. I'm like, oh my god, that's still a thing. Like those guys are still together. <laughs> oh, it is. It's something recent though. I don't think they stayed together for 20 years. I think since the boy band craze kind of started back up again. When, um, oh, I don't even know their names. The little high school boy bands. I can't remember them. One Direction. Yeah. Okay. Um, when that started up, you know. The um, the new kids on the block started touring again, and it just became insane at that point. They they toured with Backstreet Boys, uh, 98 Degrees, Boys to Men. So they've been kind of riding this high right now okay. where they can still tour. It's hysterical. And I think I've seen new kids on the block four or five times now. <laughs> <laughs> I had to... 
I had to really give that gift to my six-year-old self. <laughs> it, sure, right? It's funny how, how big nostalgia is right now and how much people will pay to go see these bands as they come back around. I know they're, I'm sure they're selling thousands and thousands and thousands of tickets. Like, they wouldn't be doing it if, if the demand wasn't there. So, you know, more power right. to them. Hey, if you can get people to come watch you, man, ride, ride that wave as long as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, let's touch let's touch on a little something uh, a little different than kind of the depressing stuff that we were talking about there earlier. But just after high school, didn't you move to Germany? You lived in Germany for a while. Is that? I did. Yeah, I t- did. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, it was the best. Um, so my previous husband <laughs> was in the army, and. I had to move to Germany. Um, he was actually downrange. Um, oh, that's that means like um, in Iraq and mm-hmm. Afghanistan and things like that. Deployed. deployed. So he was actually deployed um, at the time that they moved me there. So I went all alone. First time out of Ohio. First time on a plane. Not really out of Ohio per se. I'd been to Washington, D.C. and Florida once. <laughs> wow. But really, on a plane, out of the country, all of it rolled into one. And I had a dog and two cats with me. And, (laughs) I mean, the specifications you have to meet, like getting them cleared through the vet, paperwork, um, drilling holes in their crates because the holes that are in there aren't enough and they need a certain number of holes. Um, It was a lot of work. But I, I landed in Germany, and I was all alone because he was still deployed. And they took me to my apartment. This group of ladies met me at the airport. They kind of are the welcoming committee. Um, and I had a crate with a dog, two crates of cats, <laughs> two suitcases, <laughs> and a purse and carry-on. Because I knew I would need to pack a lot until my furniture and everything arrives because it comes by boat and it can take six to eight weeks. Oh, wow. Um, so I had to use a cart and I couldn't see anything because they were so stacked on top of each other. (laughs) (laughs) It was an entire mess, but I got to the base. I lived in Mannheim, which is about 45 minutes from, um, Frankfurt airport. And it's really close to Heidelberg. That's a little more well-known for their castles and such. Um, It's about 10 minutes from Heidelberg. Um, They also had an army base there as well. But I arrived. I got settled in. And they kind of just dropped me off and left me. (laughs) I didn't know where a store was. I didn't know where, like, a grocery was. I didn't know anything. And I knew I needed to get my dog and cat food and water. (laughs) Because they had just... They had just traveled for 24 hours without anything. I mean, they gave the dog water on the airplane, but let's face it, they were holding their pee and everything for almost 24 hours. Right. The flight's only nine hours, but by the time you do layovers and all those things, then sure. you're looking at 24 hours of straight travel. Um, so I just kind of walked around and wandered around, and I found a, the PX, um... And I bought some essentials, dog food, cat food, um, things like that. I had to buy a new litter box because I couldn't obviously pack a litter box. Right. Um, And then I had no way to get it all (laughs) back to my apartment. I had to carry it. And it was so much. I had to make multiple trips. It was awful. (laughs) Did you at least speak some German? Did you have any? No, (laughs) not at that time. No. And then... I just kind of sat abandoned in my apartment with nothing, like no TV, no internet, and this was before smartphones. It was flip phones. Oh man! So I had to. I didn't even have a cell a cell phone because I, I shut everything off before I left because I knew that it would be roaming if I took my cell phone to Germany and used it. Right. And roaming charges were really expensive back then, so. I mean, I was just, like, (laughs) abandoned. (laughs) And um, my husband at the time, I, oh, yeah, he had sent an email to his buddy's wife 
that said, can you go get Megan at this day and time and bring her over? I'm going to call at that time. And she came over and told me what was happening and got me. And I went over to her apartment and he called and he's just checking in, you know, for my arrival. And he said, have you, um, in process yet? And I was like, Oh, what's in processing? <laughs> like no one's told me anything. I haven't seen a human. <laughs> so I had to go to this office and get in process, which is like jargon for just letting the base know that you're there and you exist and getting your military ID made and all those things. And oh, I got so emotional at that lady. I'm telling you, I was like, nobody has done anything. I haven't seen anybody. I don't have a TV. I don't have a phone. Like, I don't know where anything's at. I don't know how to buy groceries. <laughs> I just unloaded on her. It was... I feel really bad for her. <laughs> so um, she arranged for one of the soldiers to come pick me up, take me to the grocery store and get all the things set up and show me what all I needed. And that was a godsend. Yeah, no he, doubt. yeah, he came and he went with me to the PX and I bought a TV and all the things, a phone, all the things I would need. He told me what internet provider to sign up with. He took me to the commissary to get groceries so after that, it was smooth sailing after I kind of got my bearings. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, after that was just the most wonderful three years of travel and sightseeing and trying new foods. And, and it really, this is really, really weird, but it felt like home. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm back in the States, I kind of feel a little homesick for Germany. Like, I felt like I belonged there. Not that I don't love the States. I do. But no, sure, I, <laughs> I really, I just, I miss the surroundings. I miss the easygoingness. I miss the food. I miss the people that I made relationships with. Sure. It's just, I, the travel, everything is so close. I mean, I got to see Paris, Italy, Belgium, um, lots of different places in Germany, Amsterdam, and most of them I went to them two or three times because they were so close within a four-hour drive. Wow, very cool. Belgium was beautiful. I got to go there in 2001 and Paris as well, but, but I love Belgium. I thought it was just tremendous. Oh, yeah. I went to Brussels and um, <coughs> oh, Antwerp or mm -hmm. Antwerpen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I went there in brussels twice I actually wrecked a brand new bmw rental car oh, in no. in brussels yeah it was bad <laughs> and i had to pay for it <laughs> ouch no kidding luckily i had taken out the insurance so it was no matter what the damage was i only had to pay a set fee mm -hmm. which was 750 euros so about a thousand dollars which stunk but it could have been a lot could, worse. Absolutely, yeah. Smart thinking there. Do you remember Jamie Church? Yeah. Yeah. When I was over there in two thousand one, you know, I I went over for a baseball thing and we played some some teams from different countries. And he's like, "Man, give me a call." So one night I'm down there on the on the payphone, I believe, and I'm calling him up, and he's like, "All right, man, me and my buddies will be down in an hour." So they came down and took me around Paris, which you know nobody else over there, none of my teammates had. They didn't have connections over there. They didn't know anybody. So it was kind of cool when I had a friend come down and get me and take me around the city and show me different things and really a cool, yeah. really a cool time. And uh, I always, th you know, I really thank Jamie for that. Who's now, I guess he's in, where is he at? Dubai, maybe the last I heard, mm -hmm. which I haven't, I haven't talked to him for years. I'd love to get in touch with him again and I'd love to visit Dubai. You know, I know he's got some young kids, but I mean, man, once those kids get a little older, I'd love to come over and for him to, you know, show me around a little bit. Oh yeah, I would love to see Dubai. But I have a I have a cousin too who um I don't know that I've ever met. Uh, my dad actually just got with her last week um and sent some pictures to me, but she I think she spends quite a bit of time in Germany and I always see her pictures on Facebook and she seems to love it there as well. I've heard, you know, really good things about it. It does look beautiful. I've seen a few movies set in Dubai, and it's amazing. 
Okay, Megan. Let's see. What else? What else can we talk about here? We talked about the <laughs> talk about the in sync letter. I mean, that's pretty much all I want to talk about. But uh... yeah, that's the highlight of the entire podcast. <laughs> exactly. I'm actually editing all the rest of this out, and we're, it's just going to be like a three minute talk about in sync and the Backstreet Boys and. Fantastic, and, and, and how guys. you have to choose the team. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think Glass would say that's incorrect, though, because she liked all the boy bands equally. I think so. She you, would say you don't have to choose a team, but oh, yeah. I am a, a firm believer of choosing a team. <laughs> I think I think you can secretly enjoy, but I think outwardly you have to choose. You know, you, yeah, you got to be one or the other, but you can also enjoy a little. You know. And I'm sure if, if you, you have to ask Betsy about um, 69 Degrees, the, the boy band that we had. Do you remember <laughs> oh that? Do you, do you remember that from, I think we were seniors and it was myself. Of course, we never sang or never did anything. We just took a picture one time and called ourselves 69 Degrees. Um, but it was Jamie Church, Chris Snyder, Ryan Fott, and myself. Um, and there's actually a picture out there somewhere. I think I have, I think I have a picture of it at home. That yeah. sounds really familiar now that you're talking about it. Yeah, we. I think she actually posted something a few years ago on Facebook about it, saying, hey, we need a reunion of 69 Degrees or something like that. <laughs> Look how stupid. See, now's your time because all these boy bands have came back. <laughs> that That's it. But now, you know, back then, you know, I was the, and still am, the more conservative, kind of shy, kind of, even though with this podcast, you know, in my job now I have to talk and I'm more vocal Whereas back then I was kind of a little bit more introverted, but now you know they're they're the all they're all old men because they all have kids and families, and here I am kind of, you know, uh, I'm I'm the single guy, so I don't know if I can be the the single guy of the boy band group. You know that that guy always got in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was the troublemaker. There was a troublemaker in every group. Exactly. Well, Megan, let's talk a little bit about, I know, you know, we touched on the stuff earlier from, you know, your childhood and, and reading a lot of your, of your posts and, and talking about the depression and then obviously the, the physical transformation that, that you've made, which is amazing. Congratulations on that, by the way, super good work, like definitely proud of you. That's awesome to see. Um, do, do you feel, do you feel that obviously the, the depression that if you want to talk about that a little bit, how that maybe kind of fed into you getting to a point where you didn't feel happy with yourself or didn't feel healthy with yourself? Um, and what made you make that transformation? Yeah, of course. Um, I think, you know, I've always been a yo-yoer anyway. Um, after high school, especially, I kind of maintained just like an average weight up until graduation. And then after high school, I didn't gain the freshman 15, I gained the freshman 60. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just kind of carried that around for a few years. And um, it was actually in Germany that I lost the weight. Um, I don't know if it's because of the lack of fast food and um convenience there they do have some fast food but it wasn't on every corner like it is in the u.s um between that and the amount of partying i did (laughs) (laughs) i mean i I wasn't ever a partier i you know i was kind of i grew up uncultured and a little a little introverted Mm -hmm. and um now I just I kind of say I'm an extroverted introvert, there but because um, I have I have both of them in me, um, but I just I made friends there, and I think that was something I was lacking in the states because of course we grow apart, we don't talk to our friends anymore. I just kind of was in this seclusion in Jackson with my husband, and and that was my world between going to school and work and I just did what everyone does and kind of just stopped communicating with your friends. So I landed Germany and I made friends with some of the wives there. And when I say partying, I don't mean actual like going out, getting hammered and doing drugs or anything like that. I just, I was making social connections and, and having fun, which is something I had never done before because I married young and I skipped that whole 
kind of freedom step. Mm -hmm. So I went from my grandma's house to being a wife. And um, so it was something I had never experienced before. So when the girls want to go out and have some drinks and listen to some music and things, I did. And I, I got to the point where I was doing it a few times a week, and we would dance, and, and the weight just started pouring off between not eating fast food all the time and, and dancing, and um, it just it started pouring off. And I had lost 60 pounds before I knew it. So after that, I came back to the States. I maintained for about a year. And then, obviously, met my new husband, fell in love, got comfortable, and got fat. <laughs> <laughs> As it happens. <laughs> Same thing happened to him. He had lost a huge amount of weight when I had met him. I had never known him as a bigger person. And he was thinner when I met him. And same with me. He met me thin. And then we both kind of packed on the pounds together after that. So, lots of yo-yoing. Um it got to the point a couple years ago, I was the biggest I had ever been, and my real aha moment was when I was in the doctor's office. I was 256 pounds, and I was there for my physical, and she brought up my weight, which is a normal thing in a physical. They always ask you if you want to lose weight or you need to lose a few pounds, Um and she said it in the most kind way she could. I'm sure she was tiptoeing. But she said, have you ever considered after bypass surgery? And I was floored. And I, I said, uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm big enough to have gastric bypass. <laughs> that is how <laughs> clouded my brain was. <laughs> mm. uh, I was really in denial, I think. But she said, Megan, you could lose 50 pounds and still be big enough to have gastric bypass. Wow. And it really just, it stung. Um, she gave me some information about a class to listen in on if I wanted to seriously consider it. And I signed up for the class and then I didn't go because I just, I didn't have a good feeling about it. Um, a doctor had once jokingly said to me never have a voluntary surgery only have surgery on something you have to have it on mm -hmm. like life or death situation um and that really hit home with me and I, I i try to remember that and i just i couldn't i couldn't do it i couldn't even consider it 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 wasn't for me and i'm not i'm definitely not trying to say anyone who's done that was wrong or anything that it just wasn't my path sure. I whatever anyone else wants to do fine like I'm great I'm great with you getting yourself healthy and whatever means you need to do so mm -hmm. um so I didn't go and that was in September of 2017 a couple weeks later we were scheduled to go to the beach um my husband and I and he had picked up this book by Dr. Jason Fung. It was called The Obesity Code. So um, it was really about why you get obese, why you gain weight, why you can't get your weight off, and all of the science behind that. And it all kept coming back to the same thing, uh, sugar and carbs. So he really got invested in this book. And he said, when we get home, I'm done. No more sugar and carbs. I am, I am for real this time. And he did. He got to work immediately. And he lost, I think, like 30 pounds in the first month. Wow. Uh, yeah. And it really took me a while to get on board. <laughs> <laughs> this is my aha moment drug out for a few months. <laughs> so I think, I mean, I wasn't really eating meat. And I hadn't really... 100% ate meat in 10 or 15 years. I ate it here and there, but I was so picky about meat. I just didn't enjoy it. Um, that I had went full on vegetarian sometime in that year. Um, but it wasn't helping. I wasn't losing weight because I was a, a junk food vegetarian. I was still eating the potatoes and the chips and the pasta and right. macaroni and cheese. And I wasn't eating 
salads every day. <laughs> I do like salad. I do like vegetables. I just wasn't eating them every day. Um, so it took me a while to get them really on board with it. I think around February of last year, oh no, of 2018, um, I was the most depressed I'd been in a very long time. Um, I definitely go through waves of depression. It's up and down. I don't, I don't feel depressed every day, all day. Um, I, I kind of get hit with it for a few months and then it, it leaves for a little bit. It's not as bad. Um, and I was definitely deeply depressed and I know a lot of it had to do with my weight. I had, I had, I had become a recluse. I, I wasn't going out with friends. I wasn't making plans. I was turning every plan down. I had stopped going anywhere so anyone could see me. I had stopped taking any photos. And if someone posted and tagged me in a photo, I would remove it immediately. <laughs> I was just so unhappy with myself. And, but I had never even considered doing low carb because the amount of meat you have to eat, I was, I was a, a carb food junkie. It's so hard. It, it's so hard to it, stay it, away it, from carbs because everything. I'm the same way. I'm like, man, but I like this. Well, it's loaded with carbs. Well, I like this. Oh, carbs, and it's like, right. uh, oh man, and and it does, and you can really feel the difference if you have a day, a week where you are, are eating bad like that, and not necessarily eating bad. But just, again, eating too many carbs, you do feel that. Like, my gosh, I feel heavy. I feel, you know, even as a dude, I'm like, I feel bloated. Like, it just just feels Mm -hmm. awful. You wake up the next morning, you feel terrible. You're like, what the heck is is going on? Like, I'm not eating, like, (laughs) junk food. I'm not, you know, putting anything else in my system that would cause me to feel this way. So it's got to be the the carbs and the sugar, man. It's just, ugh. It is. And it makes me feel terrible now when I eat it. I not only have a belly ache, but I'm bloated. I'm my belly looks double the size. The carbs just really don't agree with my body anymore. Um, and it's hard. I'm I'm not perfect. I have moments of weakness. I I cheat from time to time, but I try not to make it a habit. Um, but I started around February or March, and. There was no going back after that. I'm a habitual quitter of all diets. Right. I do not stick to them. <laughs> I, I just don't. I'll do it for a couple of weeks or I'll lose 10 pounds. And I'm like, eh, I'm going to reward myself with carbs and sugar. <laughs> right. And <laughs> Good I think, job. I think most people are like that with diets. That's why I don't think necessarily – I don't think diets – I think diets are good a good starting point. But you can't, you can't neglect yourself of, of – of certain things you know what I mean your body's gonna want this and then if you do cave then you're gonna eat double or triple of what you should right it's like I think because it, then you get cravings exactly that's why I think the mm-hmm. the diet's good to get things started and then it just becomes a lifestyle change it's like right you know it's not all this is I, just the way I eat now I'm not on a diet right yeah absolutely so um I I told Kevin I wanted to start and I kind of was hesitant to have that talk with him because he knows I'm also a habitual two weaker <laughs> and I <laughs> I'm sure he thought I would quit I thought I would quit I had no faith in myself and I just I didn't like the first week or so or two weeks was very difficult you go through withdrawal because your body is addicted to sugar and carbs mm-hmm. um you 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 have the shakes, you have belly aches, you might have headaches, dizziness. I mean, just all of the things that make you want to quit and go eat a Snickers. But I stuck through with it and I got through. And then, I mean, three or four weeks went by and I hadn't even noticed, but it dawned on me at that point that I hadn't quit and I had never not quit. (laughs) (laughs) This was a first time thing. And so I said, have you noticed I haven't quit? Like, what's happening? He's like, yeah, I didn't want to say anything. You always quit. And I didn't think you'd do it. (laughs) Thanks for the support. (laughs) Right. Thanks for your honesty. (laughs) But yeah, I just, I kept doing it. And the weight just poured off of me. And 
even more than the weight, I felt good. I mean, I had mental clarity. I felt good about myself. I had confidence. I, even though I was still bigger than I should have been and that where I wanted to be, none of that mattered. Not, the weight loss didn't matter in those moments. I just felt good. Like, I wanted to go places. I wanted to go to the mall. I wanted to go. I mean, that is not my personality. <laughs> I'm very introverted and kind of want to stay home all the time. <laughs> I just, I just felt good, and I, it was bursting out of me, and I didn't know how to get it out unless I went somewhere. Like, I was just full of this positive energy. Sure, sure. I mean, and, and if you're doing something like that, man, you want, it, not that you're doing it for other people, but I'm sure you want other people to see the hard work you're putting in. Like, hey, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing good. I feel good. I kind of want to show it off a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely had moments of where I haven't seen people in a long time and they didn't recognize me um, at first glance. I mean, you know, they do a double take. Um, but I think what shocked me the most during this entire journey has been the amount of negativity that I've been met with that I didn't realize would happen. I, I was unprepared for it. Um, like the people that say, you look the same to me, or, I mean, <laughs> um, you don't look that different, you couldn't have lost that much, like, that's just, pe I, that's just people who are, they're unhappy with their own life, so they want to try to make you unhappy too, that's, yeah. that's all that is, you know, they, they're miserable, so they want you to be miserable with them, and that's just, eh, you know, you know yeah. what you feel, you know how you, you know, you know you, the work you've put in, so don't let anything like that bother Absolutely. you. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of, um, what did they say? Um, the, you, your before pictures was were just taken at bad angles. You weren't that big. And, and I just, I, as much as you try to not let it affect you, it, it does. I mean, it, it gets in your head. But I've just had to remove those people from my life, like delete their number from my phone, delete them off social media, and just, that's the only way I can deal with it is not let them in my life. Sure, because as much as you try not to, negativity will breed negativity. And you get around that, you, you get to hearing them, then your mindset becomes negative, And then you might, like you said, you might cheat for a day. And then next thing you know, a week later, you're, you've totally, you're kind of out of that rhythm again and maybe put on four or five pounds. And it's like, uh, just stay, yeah, stay away from that kind of thing. And Yeah, absolutely. The obesity is... I mean, in my opinion, completely a mental game. Like, it's not physical. It's not that you don't want to eat a salad. It's that in your head, the food you want is making you feel better. Mm -hmm. It's satisfying your cravings, and it makes you feel better. I mean, french fries make everyone feel better. <laughs> right? Dip them in a frosty, even better. Yeah. <laughs> No doubt. But and yeah, I, I've lost about 80 pounds. I, I'm like 79.8, but I just push it up that point too. Oh, that's, I yeah, 80. That's, that's 80 pounds. <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing. And, and looking at your at your photos, and I see that your husband, he's continuing to do it as well. And it's it, to see the pictures and the smiles and like you guys are doing this together, like that's a super cool thing. Yeah, it's really made it easier. It really has. And I really feel bad for the people that live in households who only one of them has to eat healthy because, you know, the, the kids and the husband are all a healthy weight and they don't want to eat the non-sugar, non-carb things. And I just, I really feel bad. I'm so lucky that I live in a house that doesn't have any temptation in it. Right. That's that the he's thing. doing with me. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Don't. Don't buy that stuff. You can't eat it. If you don't have it around, right. you can't eat it. Like, as hard as it is, just don't get it. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, that's the same, you know, go back to other issues, drinking. You know, I have a lot of friends, well, a couple friends with really bad drinking issues. It's like, hey, listen, this is a whole separate topic, and I won't, you know, talk too much about it. But it's like, you don't buy it, you won't drink it. You know what I mean? Don't, yeah. Don't bring it in to the house, you won't drink it. So, same thing with the food, man. Don't tempt yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you the hundreds of dollars of food I threw away when I decided to start because I knew if it was in this house and reachable, I would eat it right. despite the diet or the life 
lifestyle change. So I emptied out our deep freezer, our pantry, our freezer, because bless Kevin's heart, I was still eating all of the mac and cheese and french fries <laughs> the entire time he was on this diet. <laughs> and he had to be strong. <laughs> right? You were just testing his power, I wasn't huh? strong. <laughs> I threw it all out. Every temptation. Good for you. You can't put a price on your, on your well-being and your health, so... You know, a couple hundred bucks worth of food in the long run is going to be well worth it. Right. I mean, if it's worth saving your life over, absolutely. So it looks like, have you guys followed pretty much like, do you do the keto diet? Do you do you try to stick close we, to that? We stick close to it. I wouldn't say, I think the keto police would say we don't do the keto diet. Right. <laughs> the, they can the, be very harsh. Those people are like, those people are like people who do CrossFit. You know what I mean? It's like, yes. just it's calm. Like a cult. <laughs> yeah, it's like, calm down, Karen. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, like if, okay, so the essentials of keto is basically meat, eggs, cheese, nuts, vegetables, and some fruits. Very limited on fruits because they're so high in carb and sugar. Right. Um, so I eat a lot of berries. But everything else in... I mean, like the peanut butter and stuff, it's all natural, no sugar, no oils, just peanuts are in the ingredients. Um, but unlike the keto cult, I will work something in that's a healthy food if I feel like I really want it and it's a health food, it's not french fries. Um, like if I want an apple or an orange or something that is not allowed and I can squeeze it into my day, I will. I'm not going to feel bad about eating an apple. Right. It's, it's, I don't even remember what the carb count is now, 15, 20 carbs, but I'm not going to feel bad about it. Keto is 20 carbs a day, but if I eat 30 carbs that day, I'm not going to kick myself over it. <laughs> right. If I want a dang apple, I'm going to eat it. That's it's, right. It's right. a fruit. <laughs> Now, you guys have – I was looking back through, and it looks like – do you guys have a, a website or something that you put, like, recipes and stuff on? Is that something you still do? Is that something you did for a while? Yeah, we have actually a Facebook page. It's called Way to Go Keto. Mm -hmm. um, way is spelled, like, way in, mm -hmm. W-E-I-G-H. Um, and we post recipes on there. Um suggestions tips that make things easier help with keto flu cravings um other articles like medical articles we found written by doctors just anything that's encouraging to help people we actually have gotten up to i think like 500 followers wow very um, cool. yeah they're not very vocal they're silent followers <laughs> Sometimes I feel like we're posting to nobody, but <laughs> but once in a while they'll comment and they'll say, I'm a, I don't usually post, but this helped me, so I know they're seeing it. So Sure. I mean, as long as you put it out there. You can't help what people do with it or if they say anything about it. As long as you put yeah. it out there, you've done your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the feeling was so great. I felt like I had discovered something that was hidden, sure. <laughs> and I just – it. I wanted to bottle it up and give it to other people. So we created that page. Um, I know it's helped a few people, um, but if nothing else, it can at least give them some ideas for someday when they, they want to try to make a change. I'm a firm believer in you won't do it until you're ready. Sure. Like you can't force somebody to go on a diet. You can't call them fat, tell them they need to lose weight. That Those are not motivations. Those are crutches to making them eat more. <laughs> Right. Yep. That makes perfect sense, and that's well put for sure. You got to be ready for it, and that's kind of circled us back around to the the whole drug issue. You got to be ready to make that step. You got to be ready to put yourself into rehab or whatever. Nobody else can do it for you. Right. I could want it. I mean, the amount of want I have inside me, I could want it for everybody, but it just doesn't work that way. Right. Well, we talked a little bit, Megan, about you, – you were talking about struggling with some depression and things like that, and I'm going to put um, – at the end at the end of the show, I'll put like uh, – I think you had put it in one of your one of your blogs, like like suicide hotline number or if you need help, mm -hmm. like, like a texting number, and I'll add that all in here. But any, any other advice, anything, any certain websites, anything that, that you have, if, if somebody's out there listening to this and they're just – 
they're just struggling. They're like, you know, maybe not necessarily suicidal, but maybe just having a really hard time and just need to need that next step or that little nudge, you know, where can I go to? Who can I go to? Do you have any, any advice for them? That one's a hard one because just like weight and addiction, you have to really want the help and depression is evil and it plays tricks on your mind and it convinces you that you don't need help. You're not worthy of help that you shouldn't talk about it. These are all things that go through our minds as depressed people. And it is so hard to convince yourself to take that leap, to talk to somebody, to do something, to be proactive. Um, it just, the, the depression can get the choke hold on you and you will believe everything it does to you. Um, so I think the biggest thing that I could recommend is, is talking to somebody. I know I have been in and out of therapy since I was an adult. Um, I think I made it through school. Okay. (laughs) Without, without really what had happened to me, my childhood, because I had so many other things going on that I never really reflected or lingered. And once I was, Once I was an adult, it really hit me. It hit me hard. And that's when my depression really, really showed up. Um, So therapy is your best friend. it's, it's, It's a little intimidating to make that first call and set up an appointment and to actually show up um, to talk to, excuse me, to talk to a stranger, but it is one of the best things you could ever do for yourself. Sometimes they just sit and listen. You want to cry and moan and talk about how unfair life is. They will sit and listen. If you're open to recommendations or tips on how to heal or, or cope with things, they'll offer you coping skills. I mean, it's life changing. Um, another thing is to talk to your doctor about it. I, I'm one of those people that (laughs) I should, um, I should do as I say, (laughs) because I have been off depression medicine for about seven or eight years this last time. Um, I, I got in a really good place and I was doing great mental health wise. It came in waves, but nothing that was suicidal or, or, very traumatic so I was able to stay off medication for a long time just by going to therapy and taking these these skills that I had learned and how to deal with things um but this last time I went through about in around September to December just recently and I I was just really having a hard time and I was seeing my counselor and I finally made an appointment to talk to my doctor about it. She of course knows my history, but I was avoiding making that appointment because I knew she would tell me that I need a medication and there's no shame in that, but I couldn't shake it because I felt like I had succeeded, like I had accomplished getting off medicine and taking medicine again was going backwards. I convinced myself of that. Um, But I did it, I talked to her. We had a long discussion about different medications, things I tried, things that didn't work. And she made a recommendation and she gave it to me and she said, if this doesn't work in a couple weeks, call me, we will sort it out again. And it was difficult. I felt like a failure, but that was depression talking, not, not my logical sense. (laughs) So I I took the medication. Um, I've been on it about a month now, maybe five or six weeks. Um, and I do feel so much better. I really do. And I don't know if it's, I, I'm scared to say it's all the medication because it could be just a complete placebo effect. Like I have this sense of trust because I'm on something now, or I mean, I just don't know. Um, it, 
it's 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 really a difficult thing i i do feel better though so i'm glad i i did go and i'm glad i did take the medication um i definitely don't regret it so counseling talking to your doctor even if if you're in a place where you have limited resources and there's not counselors around you or affordable counselors even talking to a friend helps um, I can't tell you how many times Katie has heard a breakdown in one of our <laughs> offices or break rooms. <laughs> she has had to pull me back together a few times. <laughs> but that's what good friends do. You know what I mean? That's 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 yeah. when you know you have that friend you can count on. And I think that you know there's still that stigma out there, unfortunately, with oh mental oh you got mental health issues. That but that's a that's a you know that's a a pretty wide scope. It's like man, it affects. I think everybody has a little something that they go through, you know. So there's it's oh, nothing definitely. it's nothing to be ashamed of. There's millions of people going through. I've luckily never dealt with depression. That's not something that I even understand, and I won't because I've never been through it. And I hope I never go through that. Um, but I know multiple people who have and who do, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Like you said, reach out, get help, talk to a friend, talk to a a doctor. You know, do research, man. We have all this research. With the internet, we have a lot of stuff at our fingertips now. You can read other people's stories. There's always people out there that you can you can reach out to and, and get rid of the stigma that, that there's something wrong. It's like there's nothing wrong with you. It's just how we deal with different things, man. And and you can get you know, you can get help. Definitely. I think one of the worst things that that breeds depression is secrecy. I know when I'm keeping it to myself and I'm not talking to anybody about how bad I feel it's worse it just festers inside you it creates suicidal ideation it creates risks in relationships the best thing you can do is get it out to somebody the relief you feel that you're not holding the secret anymore is amazing even if it's just a friend or a doctor you're telling just get it out of you it's such it's a it's the first step in the right direction you'll feel so much better very good, Megan. Like I said, I'm gonna put the uh, I'm gonna throw out the suicide hotline and, and the text number that you can, you know, you get a hold of somebody if, if need be. I'll put that kind of in in the editing process. But I appreciate you coming on and talking to me about this stuff. Again, I know it's been, you know, years pretty much since we've seen each other face to face. I know we text here and there and and kind of Facebook message, which is always cool. I, I enjoy. I always enjoy, you know, our banter back and forth and, and re kind of reliving old moments and things like that. Um, super proud of you. That's that's awesome. The, the, the physical transformation, the mental transformation, everything you're going through. Same with your husband. Pass along, you know, my well wishes and, and congratulations to him for what he's doing as well. That's that's super cool that you guys are able to do that together. Thanks. It's so nice. Of course. Of course. Now, I, I didn't know if, if you wanted to end on a high note, if you wanted to... And, you know, I read again, reading back through your blogs. I mean, I, I came across, I came across some, something about yodeling. Is that, did you, oh, yeah. did, did you want to yodel your way out of this, uh, interview? I really, really don't. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even attempted a yodel since high school, I think. That's so funny. I read that. I was like, I gotta oh. throw, I gotta throw that out at her. So funny. Yeah. That was in Mr. Henderson's class. Oh, wow. What did, did he get you to do it, or how did that come about? I remember that Kristen Summers was in my class, and she really, like, pushed for it. But I think it was to get us out of something. <laughs> um, he said, I don't even know how it came up, the fact that I could yodel a little bit. And he said, if Megan will yodel, you don't have to do whatever <laughs> it was. I don't know if it was workbook pages or what, but... Um, Kristen really, really pushed. And so I finally stood up and yodeled in front of the class. That is hilarious. <laughs> how did I never hear about that? I don't know, but you have to know how terrifying it is for me because I don't stand up and do anything in front of anybody. Like yeah. the introvert inside me just for, cringes. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. I think if you would have told, if you would have told, you know, 17, 18 year old me, that I would be on, you know, on a social platform talking to you, discussing this stuff with as quiet as both of us were kind of, you know, we were in school. I'd be like, you're yeah. crazy. You're crazy. Crazy how life life turns, huh? I remember. 
I know. Hendershot's class, I remember one thing that just always cracked me up in there because he, he seemed a little bit more, you know, he was always a little bit more polite, a little bit more easygoing with the, with the girls in the classes. And I was in there, <laughs> I was an aide one time, and uh, Scott Sturgill, I believe... Uh, I think Julie Huffman, Leanne Hatton, maybe might have been in that room, or, or Lindsay. One, it was at least at least two of those girls were in there, and I remember Scott, uh, Mr. Hendershot, asked him, asked him something. Scott, will you do this? Will you do that? And Scott's like, No, I don't know the answer or whatever. And I forget the exact banter back and forth, but it finally came back to Scott, and he's like, Well, if I wore a skirt like. Leanne or like Julie, I bet I could get you know I could get the right answer. And Mr. Hendershot, <laughs> Mr. Hendershot, deadpan looked at him and said, "Couldn't hurt." And man, <laughs> I, for some reason that sticks out in my mind, and I just I lost it. That was one of the funniest things I remember in that class because I wasn't a math person. That's a pretty quick comeback. Pretty Good yeah, comeback. yeah. I tell you what, Pat Pat was pretty quick. Pat had a different sense of humor, um, but he was pretty quick with the comeback sometimes. <laughs> and I'm hoping to have him on here. In the future, obviously, as my you know, being my baseball coach and things like that, and being mm-hmm. the baseball coach in Wellston for so long, I want to get him on. But uh, yeah, that was just a fun time, and we could we could talk about old school stories for hours. But I'll, I'll let oh, you. Yeah. We'll, we'll kind of wrap this up, and and again, I appreciate you coming on. Super fun. See, there was no reason to be nervous, right? <laughs> right. And I'm the same way. Right. I, I get whether I'm talking to. Bub or Andy or anybody, if I'm doing this show, I always get nervous beforehand too. But once you start talking and once it kind of starts flowing, you're like, man, an hour and a half's went by and it seems like we just started. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm exactly. It's the introvert in us. <laughs> exactly. That's it. All right, Megan. Well, again, good talking to you. And uh, we'll, you know, keep in touch. Let me know how things are going. Hopefully, when I get home, I can make it to Columbus and see Brandon and Katie. Maybe we can all get together and I'll bring Wade up and Bub up and we can all kind of hang out for a little bit. That'd be cool. Yeah, definitely. All right. I mean, you oh. just have to stay in Hawaii till now, uh, which is just terrible. You know, I, I, I got to do it. I don't want other people to have to come over here and, and do this. So I kind of take one for the team. It's like, you know, I don't I want... being on the podcast got you like a free Hawaii trip or something. It... Uh, Did I misunderstand? I, I think I'm gonna have a raffle at the end. Yeah, if I can get if I can get 500 listeners to this one, so it's up to you <laughs> to get me 500 listeners. Uh, yeah, but it's it's not it's not a bad gig. I'll tell you that to be to be able to be over here and when it's 85 in the winter and it's 20 back home is not uh, mm-hmm. it's not too bad, you know. Oh. Well, we're jealous. Well, it's it's here. That's why I tell everybody it's here. Come, you know, g- visit it w- once in your life. Whether you know, make plans in five years, ten years, whatever. If it's some place that you've ever wanted to come, come see it because it's an amazing place. Not just this island, but the other islands are beautiful as well, and they all offer a little bit of, you know, a little something different. Um, yeah. I think this is my favorite as far as the size. I mean, there's like 170,000 people, 160,000 people over here, something like that. Um, but it's just the right size. Where you go to the other islands, Oahu's really, really booming. Almost a million people over there, so it's more touristy. It, there's still a lot of beauty, but it's a lot of hustle and bustle. You sit in traffic for a while. If you go to Kauai, the beauty in Kauai, it's probably the most beautiful island in my opinion. Uh, a little more laid back, probably seventy thousand people over there. So, but it's really, really laid back, and there's not as much to do. Uh, Big Island's kind of more, you know more volcanic rock and and that's where the the volcano's at so it's pretty cool to see that type of thing beach wise it's not my favorite beach area but it's still there there's beauty on on each of the islands everybody should come over here at least once oh well we plan to we talked about doing a 10-year anniversary trip or a 15-year anniversary trip very cool so someday very cool any questions you might have get a hold of me i'll hook you up with some ideas and things to do all right, sounds good. All right, Megan, well, enjoy your trip, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. All right, thanks, Megan. Uh-huh, bye-bye. All right, guys, that was my interview with Megan Jenkins Montgomery. Really had a fun time doing that one, and I just want to thank Megan again for coming on to the show. She did want to clarify a few things. She got with me after it was over, after she had thought about some stuff a little bit, and uh, she just wanted everybody to know that she really regretted how she left the subject with her mom. 
she said that now that she's a little bit older, she, she kind of understands the choices that her mom made, and, and she's not mad at her anymore. She doesn't hate her, and she's kind of at peace with it. She understands her mom was young when she made certain choices that she made that really affected Megan's you know, childhood. And, uh, you know, she's not condoning her mom's actions by any means, but she just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that, that again, she's at peace with it and she doesn't hate her mother by any means. So, Megan, again, I thank you for, for being on the show. Um, also, I told her that I would I would throw out the, uh, the suicide hotline. She touched on depression and suicide and things like that. And, you know, if anybody out there listening is ever having any thoughts like that, first of all, if, if you know me, reach out to me. I'll talk to you. If there's anything I can do, I'm always here to listen. Um, I enjoy, you know, talking to people and trying to help people if any way I can. But if you really need just to, you know, you, you don't know where else to turn and you need to, to reach out to somebody, you can reach the crisis, the crisis hotline. At, uh, you can actually text HOME to 741-741. Uh, and you can also call the suicide hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Um, so yeah, guys, if, if any, you know, if any of you guys out there are dealing with issues like that, um, and there's anything I can do, please reach out. Um, again, thanks to Megan for, for being on the show. If you guys get a chance, get on her Facebook page, uh, check out her, her keto page, way to go keto. Um, really, really fun little recipes on there and, uh, just a fun, a fun little site. Uh, and, and check out her blogs. You can get on her, her Facebook page and scroll down through and you can find her blogs and they're really good. Um, all right, guys. Well, thanks again for listening. Hopefully the next episode will be out a little a little quicker than this one uh, with all the stuff happening in the world right now. This one took a little longer to, to get out. Plus, I was just lazy. Not going to lie. I've just been kind of, these past couple weeks, I've just been a little lazy getting around to this and, and uh, that's my fault. But I'll get the next one out to you hopefully here pretty soon. Uh, the next episode is going to be with Trent Staten. Um, Trent's been a buddy of mine since, gee, since we started school. Trent's had a really interesting life. I think a lot of you guys, obviously a lot of you guys from Wellston know Trent. Uh, but I don't know if you if you all know exactly his story and, and what he got into after graduation and what he does now. So I look forward to that one and hope you guys will like it. Until then, guys, thanks again for listening to Brent Ewing's Hey Buddy podcast.